My name is Khalid Kosser. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund. I also chair the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Migration. And it's an honour for me to be moderating this session on humanity on the move. Now, we've been asked to adopt a particular focus for this session. We're going to focus on involuntary migration, not the 240 million people who move largely voluntarily, largely to work, but the 60 million people or so who are moving against their will, fleeing persecution, fleeing conflict, fleeing human rights abuse, IDPs, asylum seekers, refugees. We've also been asked to not just adopt a humanitarian lens, although clearly this is a humanitarian, very hum pressing humanitarian issue, but also to think more widely about some of the social and economic consequences. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? How can we intervene to increase those opportunities? How can we help these people make better lives in the sorts of places that they're moving to uh, at the moment? We will try to get a range of perspectives, a private sector perspective, Human Rights Watch we have here too. The UN will be joining us shortly. I suspect we'll spend a lot of time discussing Syria, possibly Europe's so-called refugee crisis as well, but this is a global issue and I hope we can adopt a global perspective too. Let's start, if we could, with Ken Roth, known to many of you, of course, a director of Human Rights Watch. Ken, what's your perspectives? Well, I think it makes sense to focus on Syria. Um, that's obviously the primary cause of at least the refugee flight to Europe. Um, and it's a good illustration of the sorts of problems that we encounter um, in generating refugees and, and, and receiving refugees from around the world. Um, the, the reason that Syria represents roughly half of the refugees fleeing to Europe today is because um, the Assad government has chosen to fight this war in a particularly ugly way. Um, wars are supposed to be fought, according to the Geneva Conventions, with combatants shooting at combatants. And Assad has chosen to fight this war by targeting civilians and civilian institutions where the civilians happen to live in opposition-held areas. The idea is to depopulate these areas, um, demonstrate this is what happens if the opposition takes over. And so um, you know, it, it, when he dumps, say, barrel bombs on cities like Idlib or the opposition parts of Aleppo, the consequence is that there's no place safe in those areas for people to be. Um, in an ordinary war, you move your family away from the front line, you get a modicum of safety. In this war, you move away from the front line, you're more likely to be barrel bombed because these are so indiscriminate that Assad doesn't dare drop them near the front line. He just dumps them onto cities behind the front line. So what are your choices? You could go to the government parts of Syria, but then you're stuck with Assad, or you flee abroad. And that's why we've had you know, four million Syrians flee. You know, ISIS is part of it. Um, people escaping the draft is part of it. But the vast majority are just escaping the barrel bombs, the sieges, um, the executions, and torture. Um, so that's, that's one thing to remember. Uh, second, if you look at you know, why are people not staying in Turkey, Lebanon, or Jordan, it's because it's very difficult to envision one's long-term life there. You know, as a short-term refuge, yes. But to get people to say, I'm going to rebuild my life here, they've got to be able to work, they've got to be able to send their children to school, um, they've got to be able to have housing and food. Um, now, Turkey's moving in that direction. They've just announced that they will allow people to work. Um, but in, in the other countries, it's very difficult for that to happen. And so you know, people are, are facing the prospect of having to sell off their daughters to child marriage or, or they're vulnerable to, to um, traffickers and the like. So they um, instead say, we're better off going to Europe, um, even though that means risking our lives on one of these rickety boats. And that's why a million have, have, have taken that step. Final point is that if you look from the European perspective, um, Europe has basically said you don't get here unless you risk your life on one of these boats across the, the Mediterranean. Now, that's you know, an inhumane approach to the asylum seekers. It's also a not very smart approach to security. You know, everybody's talking about the refugees as a, as a security threat because ISIS might infiltrate among them. That may happen, although our, our experience has been actually that refugees are much more law-abiding than even um, long-term citizens. But the, um, I think we have to ask, why is Europe not setting up safe and legal channels for people to apply for asylum from Lebanon, you know, from Turkey. Why do they have to risk their lives? That would make it obviously safer for the refugees, but it would also make it safer for Europe because you could screen people in Lebanon or Turkey. Um, they would apply, they'd be reviewed, and then you know, if they are entitled to asylum, Europe has to agree to, to take them. Um, but that would create an orderly process rather than the chaos in which the, the ISIS terrorists flourish. And what's your answer to that question? Uh, we, we don't have any prospect of the war in Syria ending anytime soon. As you say, pressure on people to leave places like Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. Europe is not managing the process well. What should Europe do better? Why isn't it doing it better? Well, look, you start by um, pressing Assad 
to stop targeting civilians. You know, these, these Geneva peace talks are about to resume again, possibly on Monday. Uh, it's not enough to just say, oh, we're going to make peace. They're not going to make peace so long as the opposition sees their family members back in Syria being slaughtered. So you know, in order to create the conditions for peace, you've got to end Assad's atrocities. And, and frankly, ending those atrocities would also help to reduce the refugee flow, even if the war hasn't ended. So we need to distinguish between stopping the atrocities and mm -hmm. stopping the war. And stopping the atrocities really has to come first. Second, you've got to invest in the neighboring countries. Yeah. Um, you know, Europe has, or the West, has cut back in its, its food aid, in its aid for housing, um, and that only accentuates the, the tendency of people to say, I've got no life here in the countries of first refuge, I've got to go into Europe. And then, you know, what they should do is, if those people are going to Europe, create a safe and orderly process. You know, starting in Turkey or Lebanon, but even those who get to Greece, they're in the European Union. You know, why do they have to pay a smuggler to get across the Balkans? Why is Europe not organizing trains or buses and distributing them um, according to you know, the EU agreement? But so far, basically, the whole burden falls on, on Germany with a bit of Sweden, um, and, and the others are not picking up their share. Uh, Khaled Abdullajana, um, you're from the UAE. You're from the private sector. The UAE so far has, has not been heavily affected by the Syrian crisis, at least in terms of people. The private sector, I think, has risen to the task and has begun to offer some support. What's your perspective from where you stand on well, this? Let me issue? correct one thing. I'm not from UAE. I'm from Bahrain, but living in Geneva, Geneva. but uh, working through yeah. UAE. So uh, just to cor correct that. Um, I'm glad Stephen is not here yet. And by the <laughs> way, the reason he's not here, because he was moderating a session um, breakfast that I was in this morning about the World Humanitarian Summit, which is going to happen in Turkey in May. Um, Look, uh, last night actually I hosted a dinner for looking into the Syrian refugee crisis and how we're going to tackle this. And it was, uh, well, Ken was there and some of the other good attendees who attended this session, which, uh, you know, in Davos when you have evenings, it's all discotheque and everything is fun. This was one of the dry sessions and I was glad actually with the attendance because it's getting very close to everybody's heart what's going on. Um, yesterday I attended a session, uh, and she's so good, I mean the report is there, it's in the website, and I think it's out here somewhere, but Madame Lagarde, she was so good in presenting her report by using PowerPoint, which she says she doesn't use much, uh, with regards to the effect of the refugees in the European uh, Union perspective. And I think I like to start from looking forward, then going back. And one good thing from a European perspective, actually, which was in the report, and this is Lagarde talking, is that the, for the future of European Union per se, having these refugees in, it's much more positive than negative. So let's be very clear, it's positive rather than negative, and there's a lot of negativity today, and I think that is because lack of knowledge, lack of awareness is one thing, and people not understanding the plus, as, which was gonna come out of this in the, say, 10 to 15 years down the road by having these refugees here. That's the positive from a European perspective. But coming from the region, I think the issue is, rather than just talking about the refugees, talking about Daesh's issues, talking about the uh, Al-Qaeda problems, talking about uh, Mr. Assad, we have Assads all over the place in the Middle East and elsewhere. Okay. Uh, today, you fix this, something else is going to come up tomorrow, simply because the basic human rights issue is not respected by anybody there. We have rulers, we don't have leaders. As long as the United Nations and everybody else puts lip, basically keeps lip service with this issue that we carry on with these rulers rather than having proper leadership in that part of the world, you're going to carry on having this problem of refugees and more refugees will be coming to Europe and elsewhere because Europe is the closest place for North Africa and the Middle East than anywhere else. United States, they don't want us, so that's good news. So we, we don't want to travel because by the time we get there, everybody's drowned if we're going to go the, way, the same way that we are coming to, to Europe. So... I think it's important to look into the causes. Rather than just talk about Mr. Assad, there are much more. I mean, in the, the years to come, we're going to see a lot of this. If I was actually a historian 30 years down the road, I wake up and I say for, se for 100 years, because it'll be 70 years plus 30, uh, what's the definition of a rogue state? Uh, for me now, 30 years down the road, as a historian, I would say a rogue state is a state which basically supplies weapons to dictators okay, to kill their own people. And guess who's going to be there on the top of the list? I'm not going to say it, but uh, I'll leave that to you guys. So I think the big boys have created the problem by supporting the dictators. And now turning around and saying, hey, 
this is wrong. We supported, they don't say we supported the wrong person, but they did support the wrong person. And if uh, most of you do watch CNN, and uh, I'm sure you did see the CNN uh, presidential, Republican presidential debate, and when Wolf uh, asked the question to the 10 candidates about if they are president, would they support dictators okay, against their own people if it is to the interest of the United States? And the answer was yes. So we're going to carry on with that. I think these are the things that we should basically look at and talk about rather than just keep it there. And we are the big countries. We do the right things for the people. But we're not, actually. We've created the problem. We've supported the problem. Yes, the people in the region, the rulers, are the problematic factor. But if they are not supported by the outside, if they're not getting weapons from the outside, if the, what I call the so-called the interest of those countries supporting them is taken out of the window, and we really look at the people. We lack, in the Arab world, I cannot talk about the rest of the world, but in the <coughs> Arab world, today we have 350 million people, and they're all subjects, they're not citizens. And as long as we don't have citizenry in that part of the world, we're going to carry on having this problem of the refugees coming through. Because the advancement in technology and what's going on in digital movement, the man in the street, the young boy, 10-year-old guy in the Gulf or in the North Africa, he sees what's going on in Japan. He sees what's going on in the United States. The same kids like him. The frustration starts there. If we don't recognize this, and that's going to translate into future problematic factors, and we don't do something about it today, we're going to have a much, much bigger problem than we're having the one million people coming in. We're going to have tens of millions of people running around coming out. So this is what I would like to look into and really address, rather than just addressing something at the moment and forgetting the future. Thanks. I'd like to come back to Europe in a moment. The Gulf states have come under some criticism for not accepting large numbers of refugees. It's really become a European crisis. What can we do to change that? Well, shame on us. Okay. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really bad that we in the Gulf, uh, we have not taken in people. Um, I was listening to somebody very prominent saying, well, if you take Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the Emirates, okay, the locals in those countries are four million people, the local people. And if we take a million, that's 25% of our population. That's the wrong way to look at it. Uh, matter of fact, we do need a lot of people. We need people, we are surviving because the Gulf today is 55 million people, if we take the full Gulf. The 55 million people, there are around over 70% are foreign people. Why not having this Saudi, the Syrian refugees or other refugees from the same part of the world coming in and we absorb them? They speak our language, they have the same culture, and we should absorb them and to be part of the society rather than the way we basically let out. And we are so proud saying we're pumping money into the refugee camps we're creating schools in refugee camps. These are all good things because we do need education. Education is the number one factor that you need today. If we talk about today, education is the most important thing for the young that you need to have that. But that's lip service to what we can do. We can do much more. And I'm not going to talk about the rulership in the, the Gulf. I'm going to talk about the, the private sector. The private sector has been very, very bad because most of the private sector in the Gulf and the Arab world they basically sit on the lap of the regimes. And because you sit in the lap of the regime, you do what the regime wants rather than doing what you think is right. And that is wrong, and that's one of the things that I wanted to push up last night with the private sector from my part of the world to actually take the ante forward and do something about it. If I could just add a quick point on this, because um, you know, when you ask the Gulf states, why are you doing, you know, why don't you take in any refugees? They say, oh, well, you know, we bring in all these Syrian workers. And so you know, if you have a job, they will give you a temporary work visa where you have no rights and they can kick you out at any time. Um, what they won't do is grant you asylum because that would make you a citizen and that would require carving up the pie. Um, that would give you political rights, you know, whatever limited political rights there are in the Gulf. Um, and so they're not willing to share. Um, they're willing to kind of allow you to be one more um, foreign worker supplicant. But to add to that too, some countries actually do take people not because of an asylum or because of the work, because they want to change the sectarian numbers. Yeah. So they take them in. So it's for the wrong reasons. Yeah. So we're not doing it for the right reason. We're doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, is it the United Nations who should be pushing the anti with these countries? I don't know. I mean, I, f I feel bad with what's going on today with Syria because it looks like after going forward and getting Assad out, it looks like Assad is staying. Okay? 
and everybody's basically saying, putting lip service to that, and nothing's going on. So I think United Nations now, the five beautiful countries sit there who basically do whatever they want to do and get away with it, I think that has to stop, and to stop now. Well, let's welcome Stephen O'Brien, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator. Welcome, Stephen. <coughs> I don't think we should over-depend on the UN. I think the private sector has a role. Clearly, governments are, are, are to blame for much of this as well. But as you know, the UN has come under some fire. Uh, the Syrian crisis is still ongoing, and the UN perhaps hasn't done as much as it could do to try to resolve that. Real challenges in places like Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon for the, for the refugees there who are often trying to move on into Europe. And the UN's also been criticised, I think, for not being vocal enough about what the opportunities are for refugees once they get to Europe. We need a stronger voice in that as well. How, what's your perspective? How, has the UN performed? Well, first of all, uh, can I apologise for being slightly late? I was chairing another meeting and the, and the traffic isn't I that. I did apologise. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, let me start from the... Clearly, I look at the humanitarian. Yeah. And humanitarian yeah. needs are consequences of failures elsewhere. So the UN, of course, being a, uh, a values-based organisation under the Charter, which has served us well for 70 years insofar as there hasn't been a conflagration, but we, in very recent times, are now surrounded by fighting. 80% yeah, of what I have to address in terms of the humanitarian needs of the world, the 125 million tonight who need some form of humanitarian assistance across about uh, 37 countries, 80% um, of that is out of conflict, man-made humanitarian need, and 20% from natural disasters. So you can see how we cannot duck the issue that humanitarian need is now a function of the failed politics, both at local level, Syria, clearly a case in point, and at the Security Council, where you can't get sufficient agreement across a number of the comprehensive issues that could then address. So in the upcoming World Humanitarian Summit, one of the things which will be absolutely front and centre of the Secretary General's report, which I'm very shortly to uh, publish by the end of this month, will be we have got to get a lot better at preventing conflict. That's the number one solution to humanitarian need. But in the meantime, of course, the UN has the political side that it's expected to try and deliver and you know, we've got to be extraordinarily careful. The people who are responsible for conflict are the parties. The UN is there to try and find a way of fixing it, and we often get criticised, and I fully accept that's likely to be the case, because the frustrations of people when they see the total irresponsibility, the lack of accountability uh, of the parties who are just going with the fight, and then the proxies who come alongside them, and this continual failure of politics where only the only victims are the innocent civilians who get caught up in this, whether they are fearing bombs dropping on their heads, or they can't keep their children in school, or they can't have the prospect of their own self-worth and esteem to move from survival to some form of thriving, i.e. a job and a, ch a chance of a future. And then, of course, then we get people moving. The other thing to be said as contextual is for the whole of human history, the mass movement of people has always happened. And it's been hugely to the benefit of the world economically, although too often it's been surrounded by the most abominable brutality. And so we've had this terrible dichotomy through history. But not all movement of people ends up being humanitarian. It's just if you don't handle movement correctly, responsibly, gener generously, uh, then there is a real danger that it slips very quickly into humanitarian, and then we have to deal with it as a symptom instead of tackling the root causes. So uh, if uh, I can be forgiven for not going too far down the political track, and I note, of course, with seriousness, what you say, and that's a context we all have to live with, but when I'm looking at humanity on the move, which is the subject of this discussion, the challenge for me is we have to reach people in need and vulnerability. The only issues for me as the emergency relief coordinator in trying to coordinate that across the system, but not given by the member states, and I am only a function of the powers given to me by the member states, I don't invent powers, I have no superpowers above what the member states can send to me. So we have to be very careful not to raise expectations of the UN beyond where they can be. Uh, but once I have the chance to, to, to find people who are vulnerable and in need and to make sure that, of course, at the Security Council on the Syria, I report once a month, I'll be there again next week. It won't be for lack of the humanitarian putting their facts bluntly in the public section, even more bluntly in the private session, and speaking truth to power. But it's what is then done with that, which is what is problematic. And of course, then when it doesn't happen, and the member states fail in their responsibilities, and the Security Council doesn't get a sufficient agreement, 
But let's not lose sight of the fact where it does get agreement, like cross-border or cross-line, that is real progress in reaching people in need. That is when you get the frustrations in the UN. Now, to some degree, we have to absorb that. But equally, I think, for the sake of the fantastically brave UN people and their delivering partners, we need to say, but don't say there's a siege there, therefore, frankly, I don't give a damn whether your truck driver gets killed. Just get to the siege. You can't do that. And, of course, those who are on one side or the other want us to be partial. But my only surviving access to people in need is I hold religiously to international humanitarian law of impartiality, neutrality, independence. And it does drive some people nuts that you are treating neutrally somebody whom you've just described as a ruler rather than a leader. And you don't like that. But if I was to let that breach in the dam happen, think who will pray that example in aid in future. Somebody even worse than you're fearing. So this principle, which has been so carefully garnered since 1860s in Geneva, is absolutely ground I have to camp on and the name of the United Nations because that gives me my best access to need. And let me take an example. Reaching the people in Yemen today, another area which is terrible in terms of humanitarian need, struggling to get the noise of it above the noise of Syria or the surrounding countries. And I'm really pleased, if I could just, as it were, put in parentheses, I'm really pleased that the London-Syria conference is focusing, of course, on humanitarian needs for the people in Syria and around Syria who fled. But it's also looking strategically at the medium to long term in terms of jobs, access to the economic activity and productivity, and making sure that education is there and protection of civilians is core to a strategic approach. Basically to chime with what most people on the move want when they're forced. It's forced displacement we have to really address. Because most people, you and me, everybody, would prefer to stay in their own home or to go back home. People with money and resilience, qualifications, when bad things start, by and large, they can choose. And they jump on planes and they go and become doctors in Germany. It's three years later. The home is still bombed out in Homs. You're stuck in two bedrooms with uh, declining food vouchers, desperately trying to survive. I spoke to a man who'd been a mechanic. He couldn't do it for long because he hadn't got the right papers. Jordan wouldn't allow him to continue working. And his eldest son, Mohammed, was becoming 17. Last term at school. And I said to him, do you want to go home? And he said, that's what I've always wanted. And my house is still bombed in Homs. But three years down, I've lost hope. And moreover, Mohammed's about to leave school. He won't be able to work, no skills, no education. He won't be able to do anything. So therefore, when he gets on his bicycle and goes around the corner, I still are waiting to recruit him. I've got to go to Germany, and now. I've got to remove him from the risk. That's what's driving movement in these protracted conflicts. It's not just a fear of a bomb or water being turned off. It is the fact that people lose hope. And then you get this terrible added using siege as a weapon of war, which is a war crime, and it is called out, and I've been saying it publicly till I'm blue in the face. It's interesting how that is often not um, reported in the press. Uh, and they want the political side of the UN to say it, rather than the humanitarian side. And that's where we get this tension, and, and that's where, from time to time, they say, well, you've not said enough because you want to stay on side with the Syrian government. Of course, I must meet the Syrian government, and I must meet all the other sides. I am obliged to hold to an impartial, neutral approach. But it does not mean I'm uh, pulling my punches because I need to stay on side with anybody. I'm not too close to anybody. My job is only twofold. After raising the money, I've got to get access, and I've got to deliver against the only standard which is vulnerability and need. And too many people want to surround that with the politics of their own fight. And that is where we get into the muddle. Thanks. I want to come back to Europe in a moment and turning the refugee crisis into an opportunity. But Ken Roth, has the UN performed? What's your, what's your response to what you've heard? I was going to say, Mr. O'Brien, listening to you, you did a beautiful job of articulating what OCHA should be doing. Speak truth to power, be completely impartial and objective, focus on, on the people most in need, um, don't pull your punches. I mean, it's beautiful. That's not what you're doing in Syria. Um, in Are Syria, you to me personally, or? Per, well, I'm speaking to OCHA. You're the head of OCHA. Okay? Yeah, no, but I, I, okay. I, I'm interested because the okay. evidence wouldn't support you. Okay, let's look at the evidence. Um, in, in Syria, OCHA drafted a so-called humanitarian response plan, which outlines you know, how it's going to deliver aid to the most needy. Um, I have a copy of the draft. It then handed it to the Syrian government, and the Syrian government edited it. Let's look at how they edited it. They took out all reference to conflict. Um, Syria is just a, you know, a, it's an earthquake or it's a, it's a typhoon, you know, it's a humanitarian disaster with no reference to violence. Um, they took out any reference 
to the Syrian NGOs that are actually the only ones who really have access to the people most in need in the opposition held areas. It's only government approved NGOs who are in there. They took out any reference to demining, which is urgently needed in opposition held Idlib. The government didn't want that to happen. Um, sieges, truth to power. Did you know the sieges just rain down from the sky? Nobody is responsible for the sieges. It's not mentioned um, who did what there. Now, why does OCHA do this? Um, it's not a matter of meeting with Assad. Of course, you've got to meet with the government. You meet with whomever. Um, but OCHA has decided to prioritize being physically in Damascus rather than reaching the people most in need. And if that's your priority, sitting in the Four Seasons in Damascus, um, you first of all, even within government held areas, OCHA is reaching not the people most in need, but the people most politically connected. But more to the point, um, you know, there, you, Duma down the road, 10 miles down the road, besieged for years, OCHA rarely gets in there. You know, Medaya, you got in not because of negotiations, but because MSF went public, um, and suddenly there were pictures of starving babies, and then you know, that public diplomacy got you in. Um, in terms of the cross-border aid from, from Turkey, which is the key to getting to opposition-held areas, the Security Council has authorized this. It's not a matter of the state's not giving you power. It's a matter of prioritizing good relations with the government um, rather than getting to the people who are most in need. Now, you, know, you could say the UN is a club of governments. What are you going to do? But there are plenty of UN agencies whose first priority is good relations with the government. OCHA was set up to be something different. OCHA was supposed to prioritize getting to the people most in need. And what you instead have done is to prioritize good relations with the government. The They're country. editing your humanitarian response plan, and they are restricting what you're doing. And so the result is you're relieving the government of the economic pressure of, of sustaining its people, um, the people in the government held areas, prioritizing that rather than the ones in the besieged areas or even the one in opposition held areas um, by, by promoting the Syrian NGOs who have been excised from your plan who are the ones who are getting to those most in need um, in, in those other areas. We well, I have to dispute that totally, and I, I can't let that go, because apart from the fact it was somewhat surrounded by opinion rather than evidence, and let me be absolutely clear, well, on the humanitarian the response plan mm -hmm. specifically, yes. it is a tool which we have to use as the UN in order to make our needs overview for the year, and that mm -hmm. then gets aggregated, so I had to announce, very sadly, mm -hmm. that the world now needs $20 billion to save a prioritized 87.6 million people this year. And we ended last year only 53% funding. To get that published, I am required, under all the resolutions, like it or not, and please go and ask the member states to start passing new resolutions if you really want to change the parameters. That is where we have to have the agreement of the states in order to publish. In order to do that, first of all, in Syria, again, like it or not, they have a law. And their law is anybody who is involved in removing unexploded ordnance is legitimately a target. They are regarded as a combatant. It is the law of Syria. They are not, like UNMAS, people who are going for the benefit of the broader society to make places safer. And so that had to be removed because it was contrary to the Syrian law. It, it was, it, you and I agree. We wish that law didn't exist. Speak truth to power. And the speak, you know, why are you deferring to Damascus? Because then I go to the Security Council, and in my speech, which I'm sure you've read, I made that very point publicly. It can't be in the HRP. You've got to be careful not to put too much on the HRP. It's a specific tool to get the estimated needs for the humanitarian plan going forward. It is not to do with the factual truth to power, which is my reports to the Security Council. Moreover, the idea that I should be more concerned whether it's Ocho in Damascus or anywhere else, to have a relationship with the Syrian government, and I am in meeting the people's needs, mm -hmm. is deeply to do a disservice to the very brave people like Yacoub al Hilo, who's been negotiating with everybody in sight for months on end. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's helpful in some ways when the publicity suddenly takes off. There was a long campaign in Madaya, which generated from last autumn and eventually hit our screens, but that wasn't the click. That was if the I, no, you're wrong. You see, you don't know the inside story. You think you do, but what was wrong is it nearly put it off track. We were in jolly near danger of losing the cross line that day it all came out because you, suddenly there was a reaction, not just from the Syrian government. And let me be clear, I don't know who you talked to, but also from the other parties saying, actually, we think we can get more now. It's all gone public. So suddenly the deal we had on the table was moved. I need to get safe lines. I'm not prepared to load my trucks and to send them through the lines where a sniper may take out the truck driver. Yeah. I, I mustn't do that. Of I have course. a duty to save lives, but also to, to look after the people who safe, selfishly want to get to save those lives. So that is why people like Yacoub and the others, incredibly brave. This is nothing to do with being more on side with the other. This is finding a negotiation through a terribly difficult, mm -hmm. complex, risky business where they're putting their lives on the line instead of us all hoping that things can happen from where we sit. Mm 
And I have a responsibility to the people who deliver as much as to the people we're trying to save. Yeah. So please, don't, und don't undermine the bravery and the sacrifice yeah. of incredibly courageous people because you're concerned about the optics of something which is happening. No, I'm not concerned about the optics. I, I want the reality of getting to people in need. I mean, Yakub, he's the one who delivered the humanitarian response plan. He went from his office in the Four Seasons to the government. And he and also delivered the food in the uh, siege well, area. He That's didn't the point. Even, like, Osha didn't even call Madai a besieged until three months into when people were already starving. So, you know, again, and of course, nobody was ever responsible for that siege there. It was just besieged by unknown parties. You know, it's an act of God. I mean, it's... Well, the you siege know, is the responsibility of the parties. It's not you know, the which party? That's the point. Which this party? This conversation <laughs> will continue, certainly, <laughs> offline. And Kefriar and Foe, it's the other way around. I it's online them, as well. Name them. Let's just, uh, I mean, people have come here... They are named. I don't know what you're reading Stephen, because I've said yeah. it. People have come here for discussion. Truth and power. Annie Sparrow's <laughs> shaking her head. We had this conversation yesterday. We say it, but who reads what? Because how much more can I say what I say? You've said it clearly. Let's, let's spend a few more minutes on humanita humanity on the move, how which is what more? we're here to discuss. Billion, so straight to the That's a hell of a lot of money in a humanitarian response plan. We need the chance to get there. 13 million people yeah. living in non-government controlled areas. Certainly, people in need that you're not reaching. Uh, absolutely. Half I... million people under siege by the government. Half a 600,000 civilians under siege by the government. Government of Syria and government of Russia drop airdrops over their populations besieged by IDRIS, by ISIS. You're not even admitting who's besieging the populations, let alone delivering aid. You're there. not reading what I've said. I and have I've said just said you've articulated a $3.2 billion plan in the humanitarian response plan, more than half of which is going directly to Damascus. And yeah, with all due respect, you can't authorize a convoy anywhere. Only the government can do that, and only SARC can, can deliver it. And we all know that the last convoy delivered to Mandaya was full of contaminated biscuits that and hundreds of children got sick and many, many children so have jolted. died already. And as a pediatrician, public health expert yeah. who works across Syria, I do know. But those biscuits in the last convoy were not contaminated. We've got to be very careful with the facts. They okay. weren't. They weren't. I'm going to make a valiant effort. <laughs> Children dying. Uh, uh, we were desperate and to get it, to the children. It's, it's, it's tough for it's tough for Yakub when he lives at the Four Seasons and he has to travel to Madaya. You know, he's brave, but he's not as brave as the thousands and thousands of Syrians working across northern Syria, delivering aid to the 13 million people outside government control. Those uh, are the brave Syrians. And we are. You, uh, they are delivery partners. I mean, the the UN is not as it were. These are not two worlds apart. These are where the whole partnership is coming together, but it takes a lot of negotiation for safe access. We can't simply say a resolution is passed, therefore you need to be in Syria today. We have to negotiate safe access. Otherwise, we put people at risk. You are not encouraging me to send people into harm's way, are you? You're not able to because only the government, as it stands, has their authority in government areas and you do not have the ability to cross lines. The aid comes across borders from Turkey. Mm -hmm. and, then and that's what I meant. 20 million people living in Syria. The government areas, 6.5 million. 13 million people receive aid delivered by the Syrians, the tens of thousands delivering aid across northern Syria, well out of Ota's reach, well out of you know, the people that are most in need. So when you speak about impartiality, they are the most in need. But raising, the money, those but raising the money is equally part of our responsibility. Not just, as you know, a coordinating mechanism. It's not. Look, let's try not to be so pejorative. <laughs> I think that you've got to be careful. There has to be security for the people. Let's there has to be security for people who go and put themselves in these the territories. <laughs> and those who choose to be in NGO work, that is entirely their choice and it's hugely admirable. But the UN has a responsibility over many, many decades to make sure its people are not put deliberately at risk. That is not something surely you would want. It's certainly not something I'm allowed even to contemplate. I have to make sure that those who selflessly seek to help others are not deliberately put in harm's way. And if you would wish to change that as a, a matter of fact, then that is at a much higher level as to what the true mandate and remit of the United Nations is. Let me temporarily end this excitement. We will come to the audience in a moment for questions on anything you've heard. But I just want to do one final round with the panelists on something that we've discussed briefly, not Syria-specific. And Carla, I'd like to start with you. You mentioned lots of refugees coming to Europe, often seen as a security threat, as a crisis, as a problem. 
there is clearly the opportunity to turn this into something positive. What can we do to do that? Why aren't we doing it? Well, I mean, you, you do get, like, the Cologne issue. I mean, you're going to get a bit of that coming into the picture, which we make it a much bigger picture. Then you get the Hungarian prime minister saying, uh, Europe is not for Muslims. All that nonsense is there. But if, if we see the numbers, I'm talking numbers, and I'm talking Christine Lagarde, who is a well-respected person through, she didn't say it because her team did it, because she made sure that it is the right thing to say. And she came out with the numbers, and when you look at the numbers, in the first years, and I think it's important that in the first years, the first 10 years, especially these 15, 17, 18, 20-year-old kids who come in through, uh, from the refugee perspective, that we do look <coughs> after those guys, because there is a threat that they can move on the other side. And that's a big, big problem. And that is a different issue which I like to tackle after this. But that element is important that we match and we get them jobs, we get them basically work permits to, to start working. And what's happening in Turkey and what the European Union is doing with Turkey, this $3 billion per year or whatever, the slip service, it's good, but again, it's, it's a worrying thing that you are keeping the thing away, saying, oh, you, you deal with it, okay, and we give you the money and then you're going to come the entry to the EU issue, all that talk which is happening is there, but how long that can carry on? I think Europeans need to be more absorbing that these people actually can be more positive economically to the countries that they come to rather than being negative. Initially, you will be negative. Initially, although there is the fiscal involvement, yes, there is going to be movement in the country, but in the 10 to 15 years that you will see forward, there is going to be much more positive for the countries the hosting countries than people do see, the European people themselves, they see it. And I live here, I've lived here for 18 years in this part of the world. As a matter of fact, I've lived for 28 years, 18 plus 10 in the UK. So 28 years, and you do see, since 9-11, this worriness about having people coming from that part of the world. And you don't blame the people. You do blame the politicians, you do blame those guys who are at the top who use this for their own purposes, for whatever reason, to come through. But I think it's positive rather than negative, and we should basically, from a European perspective, get these people in. But I'd like to say, come back to the main point. Stephen is right. He has 80% of the 125 million, which is man-made problem. I would like to see that the man-made problem stopped. Of course. And here we cannot say that the United Nations has no responsibility. It has a big responsibility towards this because actually the five countries who sit there, sure. who basically serve, by the way, all those five countries, all together, without them putting any arms into the hands of the rogue states or the rulers in that part of the world, we would not have the problems that we have today. We would not have the Daeshes that we have today. For 70 years we've been having the Daesh problem, the sectarian problem, we've been having the Al-Qaeda problem, and we're going to carry on. Something else is going to be Fahish, Mahish, whatever, in 10 years down the road. This thing is just going to escalate that 125 million suddenly can turn out to be substantially much, much more. And Europe needs to be very careful that they need to make a move. The European Union, they need to have much more of a voice than they've had in the past. They have to be, as much as it's good to be cross-Atlantic, partnership, but they need to be a partner rather than just basically a listener and being basically mm. a poodle. They need to basically be part of this and because it affects them more than anywhere else in the West. So they need to push this. I need to see that we need to deal with, as you said, the, the problem in hand today. I, as a business community person, I would say one of the best things we can do from our part of the world is education. Mm -hmm. We need to invest in education. We need to make sure the six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old refugee has a proper education because he could end up being in a negative area if we don't really look after him. And we need to do about that something about that and do it positively rather than just basically I blame somebody else, mm -hmm. which we are very good at everywhere in our, our part of the world. So we, that's something dealing with the issue today. But my worry is the issue of tomorrow is that we're going to create much, much more of this problem in the future if we don't really face up and say, you, you say that I call them, the leaders that I call them rulers, I'm sorry, they are not leaders. If there was leadership sure. in that part of the world, we would not be in the mess that we're in today. So I think we've got to basically stand up, uh, stand up and say no arms, nothing to these rulers, because the more you give them arms, the more you're going to have a problem of refugees, the more of the Daeshes of this world will come through, and that is going to be a cycle which carries on having a problem for us. So we need to stop that, mm. deal with the problem of today, the, the humanitarian issue, but let's stop having another humanitarian problem in the future, except, of course, natural disasters. Of course. That is out of our hands.
Ken, do you think we have the political leadership in this part of the world? I mean, the research is clear that if properly managed, refugee flows can be an opportunity. They can contribute towards the economy, they can contribute towards multiculturalism, so on and so forth. But I think most Europeans don't believe that. They think these refugees are a risk. They think they're potential terrorists. They look to Cologne, they look to Paris, they look to their jobs, they look <coughs> to unemployment. How can we communicate better the positives? Well, you know, first of all, I think we have to recognize that <coughs> the, the numbers here are manageable. I mean, e even though a million is it's, it's a big number, it's, you know, Europe's population, the European Union as a whole, is 500 million. So we're talking about you know, 0.2% of the EU's population. Now, that's, you know, bigger if they all go to Germany. You know, if, you, if you've got a million in Germany, you're dealing with 1.25%. Um, but, you know, compare that to Turkey, where, where the, the, you know, the refugees are 3% of the population. Or look at Lebanon, where the refugees are 22, 23% of the population. So rich Europe could handle this as an economic matter. And what they're worried about is, um, is really you know, part security and part culture. On the security side, we know from experience that first generation refugees are enormously grateful to be there. And so they actually have a much lower crime rate than, 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 than you know, ordinary citizens. And you see this around the world. Um, it's the second generation which could be a problem if they're not adequately integrated. But this is where Europe is sort of deceiving itself by focusing on this current flow, rather than looking at the Bon of Paris or, 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 or Molenbeek in, in, in Brussels. I mean, there are um, long-term you know, citizens, uh, people who are born in the country, who see themselves as French or Belgian or German, but who feel socially excluded. Um, they don't have the educational or job opportunities. They're harassed by the police. They never are, are perceived as full citizens. Um, most of them just you know, bear it, but some small minority um, will be taken in by the jihadist ideology. Yeah. But that's really the, the focus is, you know, is Europe doing what it should be doing to integrate people? The, the other element of this is, um, is really cultural. And you know, the fact that these people are you know, one Arab and two Muslim is, is what's bothering people. And this, I think, goes to the sense of, um, of many European nations as nation states defined by ethnicity and religion rather than defined by citizenship. Um, and, and you know, those who are from inherently multicultural societies like Australia, like the United States, um, it's harder to conceive that. But if you're from you know, Germany or France, um, you think that ethnicity matters more than citizenship. And indeed, many of these countries don't even grant citizenship on the basis of where you're born. Um, your blood matters more. And there's a real need for Europe to change that. In this mobile world, with, with populations moving, we've got to accept that multiculturalism <coughs> is reality. Um, and Europe's just got to do a much better job of, of genuinely integrating people um, and providing the, the educational, the job opportunities, and really the, the cultural acceptance that so far is often lacking. Stephen, put, a, put aside your UN hat for a moment. You're a European. You've enjoyed the benefits of multiculturalism. You clearly would agree with what Ken has said, but Europeans don't listen to him. How can we communicate this better? How can we try to convey the idea that these refugees are not a threat, that there's an opportunity there? Well, I would certainly not uh, ever claim to put myself in the position of a refugee, but I, I was born in Africa, clearly with a name like O'Brien. I've been part of the movement uh, around Europe. As I said earlier, there's always been mass movement of people. And if you actually analyse it, it's been to the massive net benefit, both of the people and of the place where they've come to. Um, and I think that uh, the sad thing has now become very complicated by conflict, mm -hmm and the flight of, uh, through displacement. Uh, but I think also it's uh, interesting when I think about uh, the private sector and education being such a focus, I think you're absolutely right that that's an enormous contribution, partnership that the private sector can make to this uh, uh, way forward. Uh, I would add that I think it is helpful to give people access to the newest technologies so that they can find themselves also becoming multilingual because language and communication becomes so important, particularly <coughs> in education and skills, I would argue, um, and, and access to the self-esteem that you get from having a job, and particularly for the first generation, as Ken says, is absolutely vital. The difficulty is by not addressing the sense of engagement and belonging, legitimacy, uh, that it's the second generation that tends to feel alienated, disengaged, and we've seen that in other contexts, not just Europe. I mean, uh, to some degree, that's been part of why uh, in the last three years before I was doing this uh, job, I was so heavily engaged in the Sahel, moving from an endemic mm -hmm. and challenged part of the world to something which became a deep security part of the world with the northern Mali, feeling totally disengaged for decades. 
for its other, it's a similar phenomenon. So in Europe, where you have access to a much greater economic opportunity, it becomes confused where people are worried about it being a zero-sum game of carving up the cake. Well, the whole point about these economies is they're built upon the ability and the aspiration of growth. By definition, if you have more people who can be productively active, you growth enhance the growth opportunity, and therefore, if the cake's getting bigger, it, it's a win-win. So uh, I think that is an equal argument for Europe as it is for discussing with the Jordanians about how those who are refugees in Jordan should have uh, the chance to, to work, because it will be of benefit to that economy as well. And when people can go home, it will leave a job vacancy for uh, somebody who is residing in, in Jordan. But, uh, and for those who then choose through asylum to, to stay, that would be part of the future economy. So I think that this is, um, there is a confusion between econo e economic opportunity, which of course tends to drive a lot of it, but so is security. But that's becoming questionable with the sort of globalization of insecurity, <coughs> right, into that way. But I think this question of, uh, it was a phrase used yesterday that there, there is a sort of instinct both in the receiving countries and to some degree in some of the people who are moving or have moved. And it was suggested, I, I don't know the answer to this, but it was suggested, and it's, it's sort of quite a, an important point to think about, is perhaps there's a real resistance to being integrated. Mm. Uh, people want to, do want, naturally, we all do, preserve a certain distinct sense of identity, belonging. And I think that's where we need to be careful not to get terribly bound up with the integration versus... Uh, multicultural argument is if we give people opportunity and we respect their chance for engagement and I'm a huge uh, supporter that we need to be generous and uh, and actually move beyond that word generous to something which is just a natural part of the flow of the way human beings operate is that then we can see the the win-win for everybody and the societies get stronger but it is particularly the second generation you know, it is, it's particularly making sure that people feel that they have earned and have a stake in the future of where they are rather than who they are. Right, we have 10 minutes to go. Yeah, and I do want actually, to give I, the... I think this is an, actually, um, if I may, Please. Uh, I think it's a two way issue. It's not just a one way thing. I mean, we talk about receiving countries, we need to integrate the people in. But I think that people coming in, they have to go through this process too. And let's not forget, I mean, they're coming from, it brings me to the main point again, they're coming from being a subject to becoming a citizen. That's a very difficult thing to do. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. So the receiving end, you need to appreciate it's going to take time. Okay. From the coming end, you need to understand that you have to give up a lot of things in order that you do become a citizen and really be evolved through the citizenry. So I think citizenry is the most important factor for people coming yeah. in. Brings me to the transition period. There is a transition period now, specifically now, whether we like it or not. Can, being a Muslim is a bad thing to be. I mean, you're, you're good old uh, Trump, Trumpy, I call him these days. He doesn't want us there because he doesn't want us to go to that part of the world because we're bad guys with Muslims. Or Ken, uh, what's his name, uh, Carson, uh, whatever his name is, Ben Carson, ben Carson. says that uh, all these uh, refugees are basically dogs with like rabies. I mean, th that, those are things that actually, if you say it to, uh, and by the way, I'm a Semite. So for me, that's anti-Semitic. I'm a Muslim Semite, so I take that to be anti-Semitic and anti-Semitic. Well, let's not lower ourselves. You know, but, no, but I'm, I'm, bring, I'm bringing it to perspective. <laughs> no, I'm bringing it to perspective that we have to accept that from a transition period, the people coming in, there is going to be a lot of negativity on this issue, from the receiving end. It's not easy because you do expect, because there is politics. In when you have citizenry, you have democracy. Democracy means you have multi party system, then everybody wants to be getting to power, getting the votes in, and they use everything to do that. And we see that around in Europe. So that we as people coming in, we need to understand that there is a price that we would pay initially, and we have to absorb that and accept it. It's not a question of just the receiving end, but we coming in. We get it. But then brings me back, the quicker we accept at the world life, uh, and the Europeans precisely that, the people, these people are citizens in their own countries, mm. will never have the problems that we're having today. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. I mean, we might have a bit of that problem, but not as big as that we have today. Let's turn it over to the audience. We've only got about seven minutes left. A couple of quick questions. Introduce yourself, and we'll have one more round of the panel, please, Jane. Yes, just come in. 
Uh, Jane McAdam, Professor of International Refugee Law at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Thank you all for your comments. I wanted to pick up on a point that Ken made in his introductory remarks. And uh, it relates to the obstacles that the EU itself has set up to safe and more secure movement for refugees to that part of the world. Um, as Ken noted, the fact that the EU requires people uh, from outside to have visas when a, a visa necessarily requires that you're able to return to your country uh, at the end, and of course, by definition, refugees can't. That's one obstacle. That necessarily forces people through uh, unsafe channels of movement. The Mediterranean, for instance, is not by definition an unsafe uh, water to cross, but if you're forced through carrier sanctions and so on into engaging um, people smugglers to get there, it is inherently dangerous. So the question I have then is, how do we get political leaders in Europe to accept that if they were to change the legal regime that they're currently operating, they could make that movement more secure from everybody's perspective? Thanks. Let's take one or two more. Any other questions? Please. Uh, yeah, just one aspect of uh, the migration in Europe that hasn't been mentioned yet is uh, the question of the positive benefit that uh, a large, a large uh, immigrant community can leave in terms of the aging population mm -hmm. in Europe. And I think we all recognize that Mrs. Merkel saw both an opportunity terms of the demographic change and the rapidly aging population in Germany, as well as a humanitarian impasse. One thing that prevents that, I think, from happening more broadly across Europe is because there hasn't been proper, mature, transparent political discussions about the implications of population aging. So I think there's a positive connection there. Thanks. Any final points? Please. <coughs> If I may counter that and some of the things that were said on stage strongly, I know someone in England who's very poor actually looks after old people. She hates immigrants because her wage has not go up. There's no win-win for her. Her salary will keep going down as she sees people come into the country. So this idea of win-win I think is not shared by a large part of the population who the benefits are not going to. And they're the people taking to the streets against the immigrants at this point. Thank you. I, actually, I welcome that comment because I think it really behoves us to have, a, to have an objective debate and look at both sides of, the, of these issues. <coughs> a final round amongst the panellists, a specific question from Jane, I think, for you, Ken. What can we do to encourage European political leaders to, to fix the system, to, to make this work, rather than people drowning in the Mediterranean to get to Europe? Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, unfortunately, pure benevolence isn't going to do the trick. Um, and, and that's why um, I, you know, I've tried to emphasize that if they really are worried about this refugee flow being a conduit for would-be terrorists, it's in Europe's interest to make that flow orderly. And obviously, if you set up processing centers in Lebanon or Turkey, um, some people will evade them and come by boat anyhow. But a very significant number won't. Because you know, if you had a, a reasonable chance of getting to Europe because you had a decent asylum claim um, and you knew you wouldn't have to wait forever, you could apply and you know, within a reasonable number of months get to Europe, you choose that option. And that would radically reduce the flow. Um, that makes you know, the remnants less chaotic, more manageable, and less of a security threat. So I think that you know, even though, it, frankly, the security threat is overblown, and I think the real security threat is homegrown. It's not coming from the refugees. Nonetheless, given this, this fixation on the refugees, um, one way to fix it and to make it safer along the terms that Jane outlined um, is to set up these safe and legal processes so that you apply for asylum, say, in Lebanon. It's recognized that you've got a legitimate claim. They give you a plane ticket or a boat ticket, a real boat, and you get to Europe someplace where you can be resettled. That's the optimal way to do that. It requires um, generosity on Europe's part, but in an orderly way that is safer for all involved. Carla, you spoke earlier about the, uh, the perception, I think was the word you used, that, that refugees and migrants can be a, a, a threat, but on the whole, they're positive. We've heard an example there of where people think that migrants are pressing, keeping down wages, suppressing wages, competing for jobs. Yeah, I mean, in, in short term, that's going to be the case. But again, numbers, numbers talk. I mean, uh, bringing Christine Lagarde's numbers, which has been done, uh, I'm sure it's been done in a proper, proper way, 
it shows very clearly that in the 10 years, the first 10 years, you are going to have that problem. But following that, the benefits start coming in to the countries and to the economy as a whole. So that's there as numbers. But I think that point and the point raised here together. I think Merkel, as soon as at the beginning of the problem, when she was so positive, everybody was call, calling her Mama Merkel. You know, the, and now, with the, because of the political pressure on her, okay, and that's the good thing about we need to understand, people coming from my part of it, to understand that there is politics and there is multi-party way of doing things. Because of the pressure on her politically, and because of the Cologne issue and some other things which are happening, she started to push back on what she was doing initially. So we need to understand that there is going to be that issue. So it brings me back to, to the main factor. The quicker, I mean here, the Europeans, if they stop the hypocrisy, I'm not talking about the European people, I'm talking about the European governments and the European parties ruling these countries, is that the quicker that they stop the hypocrisy of dealing with rogue states, with rulers in that part of the world, and they push down the citizenry aspect. And let's not forget, Cyprus Biko is going to be 100 years soon, the Cyprus Biko issue, and the problem started. I'm not going to blame the Europeans, the French, and the British for that, but it's a reality, it's there. We need to face up to this, and we need to start putting pressure on that part of the world to start creating citizenry. When the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, came up, everybody was sort of, how are we going to deal with this? Uh, we're going to go for it, or we're not going to go for it? <coughs> look at the people, the way they've been treated when they used to come to Europe before the Arab Spring, and just look at them at the border level, specifically, specifically Germany, how they used to treat people, how they treat people now at the border. Things have changed, so there is respect coming to the people from that part of the world. So respect is starting with respect, but let's push down the citizenry. And the only way we can do it, remember all these rogue rulers in that part of the world, sorry, if there is no support to them from the United <coughs> States, if there is no support to them, and that's why I call Mr. Kerry, I don't call him Senator, uh, we used to call him Senator Kerry, but now everybody calls him Secretary Kerry. In my part of the world, they call him Shahin Shah Kerry, because he runs the show. He can basically, at the end of the day, if the Americans don't, don't want a ruler there, the ruler is out. They will decide who's going to be there, which is a stupid thing, a silly thing. The people of that part of the world, they should decide who's going to be there. And the quicker we accept that, the quicker we push for that internationally with the United Nations help and everybody else, the quicker we're going to see less migrants coming to this part of the world. Only because you need them because, as the gentleman said at the, the back, because there is an economic need, because it's an aging society and we need people to come in which is a legitimate way to come in, rather than having it because of a man-made problematic issue, conflict, or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to conclude and then I'll offer Stephen the last word. I think the solution is before us, and I think we've discussed it. We clearly need to address the root causes, what's driving people from places like Syria. We need more support in the region, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. Let people stay there if they can, because often they want to stay there and then go back when, once it's safe to go back. We clearly need to address smuggling and trafficking. That's come up a, a little bit. Integration, once people arrive in Europe, is clearly a challenge. We need to get on top of that. More and better managed migration systems in Europe. I think the solutions are before us, but we just don't seem to be dealing with them. What's, what's the prospect, Stephen? I think in the end, this boils down to leadership. And I think what Toby said about the evidence of uh, an ageing Europe, if you were to just look at the objective facts, it has to be welcome that people want to come and support the continuing growth of the economies and also this, the, the ne necessary social context because with ageing, uh, those of us who have uh, ageing parents, we understand the amount of care that you have to surround as people get to the, uh, the, the senior end of life. So I understand the point that was made earlier very much and I think when you take it on a long time frame overall, taking you know, even a historical perspective, I think the evidence would suggest that migration leading to economic activity and a sense of belonging, if you get that right, has a benefit, a win-win. But the powerful point that you make is that the perception of somebody in a host country or receiving country has to become the polit politician's reality. They have to deal with those perceptions. And the fact that they are unaddressed means we've seen the rise of some pretty extremist, both right and left wing, counter reactions to what is going on. And that's a pretty interesting sort of nexus in itself. And so I think it does boil down to leaders looking at the evidence and explaining where if people have a perception that their standard of living is being, as it were, eroded by others uh, coming in taking their market, then 
If that's true, then it needs to be addressed. It's a political issue, of course. If it's not true, then the leadership has to say, these are the facts, you know, we understand and take seriously what you're saying, because you have to address the perceptions. Otherwise, you're fueling in these welcome democratic societies where you can hold people to account, where you can try and visibly change things for the better if you want to, then you're, you're not tackling it on the basis of the reality, and you're then dealing with the politics of perception. And, uh, and that is always the tough bit. And democracy, you know, it does have this very temporal risk that you, you actually react to a perception rather than dealing on the evidence. And that's where leadership is really required to make sure people are taking decisions. And just in the general terms, I think we should be really very positive in our thinking that we know, nobody wants to see forced displacement. That in its very nature is not humanitarian. That is not the internal choice of a dignified individual person or a family responsible person. But movement is not the worry. It's the causes of movement where they are forced. And it's the root causes we must address. And in the meantime, as I think you rightly said, we've no cho choice to sort of take a breath and think, how do we do this better? And the World Humanitarian Summit is a real opportunity to try and uprate everything we do. And I think the investment approach to the London Syria conference is a good approach. But deep down, there's always a cohort going through. And we must absolutely do everything we can to help those in need today. Thank you. People are slipping out. It's the end of the session. We've had a very passionate session. I hope it's woken you up on this cold morning. <coughs> thanks to our panelists and thanks to all of you for your contributions. Thank you.